This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. A tribute to Grammy award-winning music producer Larry Butler on this edition of Conversations. In January of 2012, the music industry lost a Grammy award-winning producer Larry Butler. At the time, Larry was the only country music producer to win a Grammy. Despite his great success in Nashville, Larry ultimately found his way back to his hometown of Pensacola, Florida. Following the devastation of Hurricane Ivan in 2004, Larry was instrumental in bringing Music City friends Kenny Rogers and Willie Nelson to town for benefit concerts. He also proved to be generous with his experience and expertise, often lending a hand to young performers. Larry's impact and influence on those around him was indelible. That was never more clear than when friends and fellow music industry colleagues celebrated Larry's life in the fall of 2012 during the Frank Brown International Songwriters Festival. The Flora Bama Lounge played host. The legendary honky tonk on the Gulf Coast is known for great music and an eclectic array of patrons. It was the perfect setting for Larry's friends to pay tribute. On this edition of Conversations, you'll see some of my original interview with Larry in December of 2009 and hear from some of his friends in the music business as they paid tribute with a night of music and stories. So hey, won't you play another somebody? Tell me how you got started in the music business. Well, I started playing piano at a very early age. In fact, I started piano lessons when I was four years old. And I knew immediately that I really did enjoy playing. I played in talent contests when I was five and six. And at six years old, I had my own radio show here in Pensacola. And it, it, it was pretty much music was my life. Right. I wound up in a band that played at the Sahara Club years ago. I used to have a very popular nightclub in Pensacola. And the reason I got into the band, their, their keyboard player was moving to Muscle Shoals. And that was Barry Beckett. Okay. So I took Beckett's place in this band, Jerry Woodard and the Esquires. Well, we played the Southern Circuit, and one of those cities is Nashville. First night, first performance, at the end of the first set, a server came over to me and said, the gentleman over the table wants to talk to you. I went over, it was Buddy Killen, owner of Tree Publishing Company. He said, if you ever decide you want to come to Nashville, I'll help you. Mm-hmm. So I told the band I was going to leave. They wouldn't let me have my clothes. My clothes were <laughs> locked up. They didn't give me the money I had coming. So I went to the club owner and I said, I need to get to Nashville. Well, there was a guy in the, in the club who was going to Louisville. He was going right through Nashville. Jeff, I know this sounds like a fairy tale, but it's true. <laughs> he was going through Nashville. The club owner gave me $20. He said, you pay for his gas. Uh -huh. When you get to Nashville, call me so I'll know you're there and I'll send you more money. So the next day, I walked into Buddy Killen's office with the clothes I had on my back and three dollars and a half left <laughs> out of that 20. I said, here I am. And how old were you? 22. 22 years old, Yeah. so in the, in the big city, so to speak. Oh, yeah. And where did it go from there? He picked up the phone and started calling Chet Atkins and Owen Bradley and Jerry Kennedy at Mercury, and he said, I got an, an, a young kid in town, really good, give him a chance. So the second you, week I was there, I did 11 sessions. Wow. So you started off as a session player? Yeah, playing piano, yeah. Okay. What, what launched you from being a session player into writing songs and into producing? Well, I was hanging out at Tree every day, and I was hanging out with Bill Anderson and Dottie West and Joe Tex and, you know, some of the greatest writers in the world. And I, every day they'd come in with new songs, and I'd play piano for them in the little studio. And one day I said, well, I can do this. I can write songs. Well, it's not as easy as, as you might think. <laughs> right. Some of those early songs were really bad. <laughs> so uh, I started paying more attention, and I started listening to the, to the radio. I started listening to the songs that these people were writing, and I really realized what the deal is with country music, especially the simpler the better. And so Buddy, Buddy Killen asked me if I could play guitar. I said, I may know three chords. He said, 
that's it. Your next song, write it with the guitar. Because with the piano, I was overriding. I was, okay. they were too complicated. Every song I wrote sounded like MacArthur's part, you know. <laughs> so I wrote a song uh, the next night with the guitar. I went in the office the next day and I sat down and played it for him. And when I sang the chorus of the song, he said, hold it. And I said, I knew you weren't gonna like it. He said, that's a hit country song. And the song was called Just For You. It has been recorded 65 times and was the number one record for Furl and Husky. I'll be so that's how, it, that's how it happened. But I will tell you this, the very first session that I sat down to play piano on, and there was a guy telling everybody what to do, the producer. Okay. I knew that's the job I wanted. To be able to take the things that you hear in your mind and make it happen in the studio and hear it coming through the speakers. It's the greatest thing in the world. That's my, that's my Disney World. And Disney World is where dreams come true. You, so far, are the only Nashville producer to win Producer of the Year. Yeah. Tell me that story. Well, when the nominations came out for the Grammys, <clears throat> I was shocked that I was in the top five. I mean, shocked. Because the Producer of the Year is historically a pop producer award. Mm -hmm. And what, in essence, what it is, it is the producer that for that year has been outstanding, that has done more work, great work than anybody else. And truly, being in the top five, I was blown away. What a compliment. So I told my wife, I said, honey, we're not going to LA. She said, why not? I said, I'm not gonna win that award. Yeah. She said, you're nominated in the top five. You're gonna pay respect by being there. I said, you're right. <laughs> so we went. We were sitting on the second row, and it was a pre-telecast award. Right. Over to my left was uh, Pat Boone, B.J. Thomas, Chris Christopherson was sitting on the front row, Quincy was sitting right here, and they, Shadow Stevens came out for the pre-telecast award. This category, Producer of the Year, and the nominees are Larry Butler, Mar Maurice White, Ted Templeton, Val Gray, Quincy Jones, and the winner is, and he went, <laughs> when he did that, I sank down in my chair, I swear, Jeff. When I saw the look on his face, he literally did a double take on my name. And I know what he's thinking. What? <laughs> he said, Larry Butler. Wow. And B.J. Thomas went straight up in the air, and Chris, they came over and grabbed me. I literally had sunk down, Jeff. I was in shock. But as I came up, I looked, I saw Quincy walking out. And I'm thinking, hey, man, I'm more shocked than you are. <laughs> that's great. But I've got it on my mantle. That is, that's absolutely awesome. Then I won a Grammy for Song of the Year. Which was? Hey, won't you play another Somebody Done Somebody Wrong song? Which is a great song. Get in, in about one minute, how'd you come up with that? I didn't. A friend of mine named Chips Moment invited me to come by his house, and I went by. And we had a couple glasses of wine. We shot some pool. And any time songwriters get together, they'll start reaching for guitars, you know. Let me play you a little song I wrote. Chip said, you know, I've got this idea I've had for about two and a half years. He sang the opening. It's a lonely out tonight, the feeling just got right for a brand new love song. I said, hey, won't you play another somebody done somebody? <laughs> 20 minutes later, the song was finished. Oh, wow. Finished, 20 minutes. So then I, I said, I'm gonna cut it with one of my artists. He said, let me do it with BJ. I'm producing him next week. Right. I said, I, I love BJ, I really do. But I've got an artist that's selling 100,000 albums, make us some money. Because <laughs> BJ was cold, I mean, he's cold. <laughs> he cut it. He told me to come by the studio and I, I sat down and when he played me that, that cut, I looked at him and I said, ooh, that's scary. I said, I'm going to say what it's going to be, a total, complete flop, or it's going to be gigantic. It was number one country, number one pop, number one easy listening, and number one adult contemporary. contemporary. So how many records does it sell all the Oh, day? millions, millions, and it's still selling. I still, I get that mailbox money about every 90 <laughs> days. I go, honey, I'll get the mail. <laughs> hey, won't you play? Another somebody done somebody wrong song. 
and make me feel at home while I miss my baby while I miss my baby so play, play for me. as a record producer and songwriter Keith Stegall has over 50 number one songs as a record producer he was he was a genius. He, there was only really two people that affected me that way in Nashville. It was uh, Larry and Billy Sherrill. And uh, I ended up becoming a record producer probably because of Larry, because I was very fascinated by the, by the way he made records. And I would pay attention to the way he built a track. And, and I would sit for hours under headphones just listening to, to the way he made records. And uh, he was a genius at that. He approached everything very simplistically. And, and, and that's the key. He, did, he never overproduced anything. He let the song stand above the track, you know. And the tracks were always good, but, but he always made sure that the song and the lyric was, the, was what was up front. Every once in a while, Larry would visit the publishing house. And, and that day when Larry was coming, and I mean no disrespect by this, the people that ran the publishing company would say, God is coming today. <laughs> I knew they meant Larry Butler was going to be in the building at some point. And I remember coming back and seeing that great Cadillac parked out front. And I went inside, and he was there, and he was in a gray suit with gray boots. And I thought, this guy even dresses to match his Cadillac. This is the guy. So God bless Larry Butler and what he's done to Nashville and how he impacted all of us with his wonderful music. It was always really about saying the most you could say in a song with as few words as you can, you know, as you, as you can say, you know, it's the most impact, which means every word's got to contribute to every line that you're doing. And, and, and it, he was very particular about melody. So when you have a really particular distinct melody, like, uh, hey, da, 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 a word's got to fall on every one of those lines of the melody. You can't really, you can't really add another word or two here because you have it, uh, because you're too lazy to make one word stay on that one note. If that makes any sense, it was very, it was very much a box you had to work within. But that's what makes really the difference to me between art, capital A R T, than, and then lower A R T. It's when you work within confinements and restrictions to get the best work, like perfect rhymes or something like that. He was from that school of, of, of songwriting. And to me, that, that's, the, that's, that's where it begins and uh, should begin there anyway, I think. I, I came up with a, a butlerism that says, a great producer is one who knows when not to. Right. Produce. <laughs> you know, just because you've got extra tracks doesn't mean you need 14 tambourines. Right. You know, just because you got extra tracks doesn't mean a French horn would be nice. You know? right, right. Seriously, the, once you learn the golden rule, and that is listen to the song, let the song tell you what it, what it wants. And that's, that's the way I, I make music. The song is the most important part of the record. Kenny Rogers, when he sang Lucille, you could see what was going on. It was vivid. Of this guy coming in the bar talking to his wife. Yeah. I mean, it was it was just clear as it could be. They're words that paint pictures that eyes never see, right? But your mind does. And the more vivid you can paint that picture, the clearer you can paint that picture, the better it's going to be. And he knew how to put a song with the artist, and he knew how to get the musicians to make the music that made it all come together. He could, he was, he was a great communicator. And uh, I think that was his, one of his secrets. Coming back to the, to the artist who can communicate, I, I've heard folks say that probably Kenny Rogers is the best at being able to take a song and communicate that to the audience. You worked with him for years and years. Would you agree with that? Oh, totally. Kenny was such a joy to work with. And, and you know what scratch vocals are. When you go in the studio with the musicians and, and, and he's singing, and the artist is singing, most times you don't use that vocal. The artist will come back a few days later and redo the vocal, make sure every note's right. 85% of Kenny's vocals that you heard on the radio were the live vocals he did with the band. 
-hmm. He enjoyed working with the band. He enjoyed singing with the band. And he would work with them. He'd, he'd see them into it. And, and, and it would make him more, you know, into it, right, so to speak. Right, right. Um, one of them was the gambler. I mean, that you talk about painting a picture. Oh, yeah. And he, he was known as a storyteller. Ruby, don't take your love to town. Uh -huh. Reuben James. Uh, Lucy, a coward of the county. Right, right. When I ask you, what was the biggest selling record Kenny Rogers ever had? What would you say? I think most people would say the gambler. Gambler. Mm -hmm. Coward yeah. of the county. Coward of the county. Isn't that amazing? That is amazing. But I'll tell you why I think it happened that way. Uh, it was a time in our history we didn't have really have a hero. Mm -hmm. And the character in that song was a hero. Yeah. That these guys picked on him all of his life, and finally he had enough. They messed with his girlfriend. <laughs> he goes and finds him, locks the door. Ooh, <laughs> that was great. Well, and that's another great story song. Are, are people who write country music, are they, are, are they better storytellers than those who write the pop songs and Broadway songs? I think so. I think they are. And, and I'll tell you who else, it would be folk singers. Oh, yeah. You know, I mean, and their stories have a lot of depth, you know, and a lot of meaning. Mm -hmm. Well, so, so do country songs. Right. And I'll be honest with you, I, I was not really a country enthusiast. When I went to Nashville, I was pretty much a rock and roller and uh, whatever. I toured with uh, Ronnie and the Daytonas and the Gentries. And so I got into Nashville and I started working all these sessions. And so after I'd been there about a month, I said, when do we get our checks? And they said, <laughs> <laughs> they come through the union. Uh -huh. You have to go to the musician's union to pick them up. Oh. So I went to the union I said, I, I understand I get my checks here. Oh, yes, sir, Larry, hang on a minute. And they sat down a stack of checks on the <laughs> counter. And I looked at them and I said, ooh, I love country music. <laughs> <laughs> who have you worked with over the years who has it all, who has the ability to, to nail the song, communicate the song, the ability to entertain the audience? Wow. Who's the best? I've had, well, let me tell you something, I've had one of the most incredible careers of anybody I've ever seen. Because I, I have worked with Sammy Davis Jr., Paul Anka, John Denver, mm. Julie Andrews. Mm. I recorded Mary Poppins. <laughs> I, I, and that's a story in itself. We went out to my home one evening. We were listening to, to songs that people had submitted for us. And we were sitting in the middle of the floor in my great room. I had a 350-acre ranch and a great, you know, it's really a great place. So we're in the floor and we're listening to the cassettes. Yeah, I know, yeah. And I, I've always loved candles. I have candles everywhere. Right. You know? Julie says, do you have a shop knife? <laughs> and I'm thinking, oops, <laughs> I've made her mad. She's going to stab me, you know, whatever. Right. I said, sharp knife? She said, yes. Yeah, so I got up brought her this steak knife, whatever. She got up and started trimming all the wicks of the candles. They burn much better when they're trimmed. <laughs> and I'm sitting there thinking, I got Mary Poppins <laughs> trimming, trimming my wicks. <laughs> that is too cool. <laughs> Johnny Cash was one of the greatest men I've ever been around. He influenced my life forever. We were doing, for instance, we were doing a movie in Israel that John was producing. And uh, we were shooting at dawn. I was there to make notes of what music to use behind certain scenes. And we're standing there on the banks of the Jordan River. John's got the Bible in his hand. And as the sun starts coming up, there was a perfect aura around John's head and shoulders. I mean, it just lit up. And it, I just went, you know, and so did his sister. And I started crying. I mean, I, I was emotionally taken by it. So he said, hold it, hold it. And he came over and he never called me LB or Larry. It was always Larry Butler. He said, Larry Butler, you all right? And he put his arm on my shoulder and I and I was just, tears were coming down. I said, John, it just, it just dawned on me what we're doing here. And I said, I really am proud to be a part of this. 
And he said, looked around at the Jordan River and looked back at me, would you like to be baptized in the Jordan River? And we had a pastor there with us who was the, you know, the expert, make sure we didn't right. say anything right. that really didn't happen. Right. Well, next morning at dawn, I was baptized in the Jordan River. I'll be. And that's something I'll never forget. Oh man, he was a salesman uh, and a half, man. Let me tell you, Larry oozed and reeked with charisma. I mean, you know, but I, I was just, he had this, he kind of had this grin and this smile like the Grinch. <laughs> you know, he just, he kind of every time, he'd, he'd have, there was some sharp eyes, and he'd something going on in his, behind those eyes, and then he'd, he'd always had a little wink. You go, yeah, you know what I'm talking about, yeah. <laughs> and uh, man, it was kind of had that little, sly grin like the Grinch, man. That's what I always liked about him. And you just knew there was so much behind that smile. And of course, everybody knows a huge heart behind that. The biggest thing I think with Larry would be the fact that he could share this beautiful area of Florida that meant so much to him with, with his friends in Nashville and was very instrumental about trying to get people out of Nashville because you can really start to think one way in Nashville because when you're going to lunch, you're going to breakfast, everybody you see on the street, it's always what's going on in the music business. You're always complaining about it. You're always talking about it. You get tunnel vision. And the, one of the greatest things about creativity is is you can't bend it or will it to your, you know, to your will. You have to get away from it. Get out of Nashville, come to the beach, relax, we'll have a margarita, we'll just hang on the beach, and boom, a killer great song idea would come. And he knew that, you know, he knew that about creativity. Get out of Nashville, think differently, always change your perspective. And he never quit trying to get better, you know. But anyhow, I was lucky enough to get this song cut on the Gambler album. We all had a ball as I recall it. Uh, Larry Butler is, was one of the great producers of Nashville, and uh, my association with Larry was uh, actually, he played with uh, Dottie West in the band, and I played with Carl Pearl Butler, and this was back in the early 60s. And, uh, then we went on and he went on. Uh, we actually had a couple times we vied for the same job. And I think we vied for the same woman a couple of times. <laughs> no, not really, but we did for a couple of jobs. And, uh, but anyhow, he always beat me out. He had a, a knack of doing it. But uh, Larry, uh, I think, is one of the great producers. And he wound up producing some of the greatest, uh, some of the biggest selling albums of all time. And uh, I happen to have uh, a one, uh, he cut a song for me, uh, The Gambler, on The Gambler album. I had a song called A Little More Like Me. It's the last song on the album, and it's uh, barely made the album, but uh, I think it sold 18 million, something like that. So Larry was fixing to cut the first records on Kenny Rogers. And, uh, and I love Kenny, because I'd heard him do uh, Don't Take Your Love to Town and some of those, and I was, and so I had the song Rosie, and I thought, man, if I get this song on him, it's all over. I'm, I'm, this will do it, you know. And so I, sure enough, I pitched it, and I got it on the session, and I was so excited. And I went to the session, and I'm sitting there, and they're wa they're running it down. The band is starting to learn it. They're they're out in the studio, and they're learning it, and they're running it down. He's saying, Rosie, do you want to talk about it? Man, I'm so excited. And about the time uh, this heavy, heavy publisher comes in the door, walks up to Larry, and he goes, whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. and Larry goes out in the studio and says, hold it, boys, we're going to do Green Green Grass Hall. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I wanted to kill him that day, but he made up to it many, many times for that. But that happens a lot in the business. You know, you get, uh, that's why you almost had a hit, you know. <laughs> Without Larry Butler in my career, I probably w wouldn't have had near the career that I, that I do have. As a matter of fact, he, he recorded a song that I wrote, Old Red, which was a hit by Blake Shelton, on Kenny Rogers long before anybody else ever did. So he's been a, he's been a big influence in my life and my career. One time we wrote uh, a song over the phone 
during Monday Night Football. And the, the way it came about was, I'd called him, he was in Pensacola and I was in Nashville, and I, I called him to see who he liked in the football game. And he says, well, I've got so-and-so. I said, well, I've got the other side of that. He said, well, somebody's gonna lose. So we talked for a few minutes and hung up. A few minutes later, my phone rang. And he says, hey, I've got this going on that, that thing. He says, somebody's staying now much later than they should. So we got the sound turned down on the football game, talking on the phone back and forth, and when somebody would get close to score, so I'll call you back. <laughs> <laughs> so we wrote, we wrote that song over the phone, which was recorded by uh, Ricky Van Shelton and B.J. Thomas and uh, a couple other people I can't remember right now. And then uh, we wrote a song called This Old Honky Tone. Actually, we wrote that song about the, uh, the Floribama. And, uh, it was recorded a couple of times, it never quite got out. And writing with Larry, if you, if you were kind of new at it, when I first got to work with him, it was, my mouth just dropped open because I'd, something I'd struggle, struggle, struggle over, play it for him, and he picks it just like that. I said, how do you do that? <laughs> he said, I'm just good. <laughs> he, he didn't have any problem with his ego. <laughs> I love him and I miss him very much. <laughs> one of the most positive people I've ever been around. I never saw him be, you know, down about anything. He was always very positive and uplifting and always had hope. He was a guy of hope. It's lonely out tonight And the feeling just got right A brand new love song Somebody done somebody wrong song So hey, won't you play another Somebody done somebody wrong song Make me feel at home while I miss my baby I miss my baby. We hope you enjoyed our tribute to Grammy award-winning music producer, Larry Butler. I'm Jeff Weeks. Thank you so very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the broadcast. Take great care of yourself, and we'll see you soon. Support for this program is provided in part by these corporate sponsors. And by viewers like you.